The Johnny Depp defamation trial is so fascinating, particularly because if you listen to the recordings, which I did, I think they were released maybe 2020, where they were recorded conversations between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. And when I listened to them, I completely saw the manipulation that Amber Heard engaged in. Um, she constantly externalized blame, like she, to a point of, of, of absurdity, whenever, like Johnny Depp seemed to be at getting, trying to get at the truth in the conversation and trying to approach things with respect, curiosity, and understanding. Um, and, and Amber Heard was just deflection central. Uh, for instance, she even argues about his word choice of punching or hitting. She said, I was not punching you, I was hitting you. And, and so there, there was a constant externalizing of blame in even little tiny nuances like her, um, when Johnny Depp was also trying to get at the truth by saying, you know, you told Travis about this incident and then she went off on a deflection of acting like Johnny Depp is gay with Travis, like in order to avoid the direct point he was making, which was, you've told the truth before, let's try to get to the crux and get to the truth and let's try to understand. Again, she deflects in, and notice, what I noticed in those recordings, she always deflects in a way that humiliates him or puts him on the defensive about something else. So she, he'll bring up, hey, you know, you threw an ashtray at me. You threw pots and pans. And she'll be emphasizing, well, you left. You left after I did that. And you can't leave during a fight. It's abandonment or there's a implica there's a, she immediately externalizes the blame to how he is a problem. And he's, he says, yes, I leave because you're throwing pots and pans. And she'll act like, well, so what if I'm throwing pots and pans? You're leaving. So that she'll have the admission of guilt, but then still trying to revert to these, these constant deflections of blame. And, and so it's, it's a fascinating uh, look, or listen really, when you listen to those conversations, you immediately understand kind of this circular conversation where somebody you're trying to talk to is always, is always like making a, 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 a sharp left turn and, and, or a U-turn. And they're always kind of uh, deflecting to a point of absurdity. They're deflecting, they're avoiding blame and you can't talk to them and you can see why it's crazy making because um, every time Johnny tries to say, hey, let's, let's look at this situation and what we both did. Now, I did this, I did that, you did this, and you did that, and she will just say, uh, she, will, she will just never have the kind of moment of admitting, hey, I did get, I got way overreactive and threw pans, or she never kind of has that ability to kind of stay with what she did wrong or what the direct point he's making about it is, she always has to try to put him in the inferior position, like your, or the humiliating position. And you, you see how these conversations, you can never get anywhere, which is why usually uh, the person who's trying to resolve the issue is the one that says, can we record our conversations? And then that way maybe you'll see how you're, you're not able to understand my point of view. You're not able to take responsibility. Uh, but, but you see, it, it's so good that they did record these conversations because for the public to hear them, we get a sense of the dynamic immediately because we get, a, we get a sense of her particular type of emotional abuse and how she, like even in that kind of dig at, well, you're leaving, you're a baby, or you're a baby if I'm hitting you and you can't take it all. She always goes for the jugular and kind of tries to make him feel like on the defensive, but he stays completely 
um, at that level of wanting to resolve it and be calm. And of course he, get, he gets um, activated, of course, by her, but he had, in comparison, he is the one who is trying to understand and resolve the conflict. And so it's great to finally see, um, because when I, when those recordings were released, all of the media just had the narrative, the default narrative of Amber Heard is the victim of Johnny Depp. And so that was another, actually that was another moment of me being red-pilled about the media is how they represented this case because their representation, characterization was completely at odds with if anyone who actually listened to the dialogue um, between them, you can really see in there how manipulative and corrosive her tactics were in trying to keep him under control and completely never owning up to anything she did. And the, the volatility, because she even said something along the lines of, um, you know, go ahead and try to say that you're a victim of domestic abuse and see if they believe you, a man, are, are being abused by me, a woman. And I mean, she, she you know, we, he called her on that. And I mean, because the truth, even though the truth takes longer because the lies circulate quickly, the truth wins in the end because you put it ahead of a jury and lawyers and they see it, the public sees it, and it's clear what the dynamic is because the truth reveals it. The truth of all and all of its nuances and details and big picture, you all presented, it's very clear who is the one that's antagonistic and almost feeding off of this violence and, and, and this constant circular conversation. Anyway, so it's really affirming now that this case is finally seeing the light of the truth and letting and the public seeing it because at the time I was listening to those recordings, which I think was early 2020, uh, it was just default assumption that Amber Heard good, Johnny Depp bad. But even, you know, I remember at that time I watched a speech by Amber Heard at a Me Too rally and, or women, Women's March actually, so Women's March, and I thought, there's something so disingenuous about how she's just peddling out platitudes. Like she has this weird thing, like she wakes up in the morning with a fire in her heart. Just a lot of kind of uh, very, very kind of bullshit bromides and not a sense of like a weird glibness in her demeanor. And then her, her body language in that video also felt off. They're just, when I watched that, I thought, oh, wouldn't anybody that just saw her think she's off? But the thing is, is she presents very charming and she's so attractive. And so it makes sense, you know, it, uh, um, I can see how she would be just completely a siren and manipulator of men. And, 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 and Johnny Depp's background too, he had a abusive, chaotic home life. His mom was always moving and kind of had this kind of rage, whimsical way about her that the he learned to kind of really anticipate whether she was going to react to a slight or whether she was going to be in a volatile mood. So he had that in his upbringing. So it's a, it's a familiar pattern when he then does encounter Amber Heard. So that to the point where he may not recognize the red flags as much because they're a familiar pattern of behavior that he had growing up. So it's really interesting. And today uh, we, we finally saw a psychologist give a diagnosis of Amber Heard. And her diagnosis was based on a very thorough test that Amber took. Um, I'm forgetting the exact acronym but it's out there. And then also it was based on her spending 12 hours with her, I guess. Um, to my understanding, that's what it was based on. And so she, that, that, that diagnostic test revealed that Amber Heard was histronic and borderline personality. And so it was, it was interesting to see that. I was thinking she was on the narcissist spectrum because uh, of the 
um, you know, grandiosity and deflection of blame. But the truth is, is that most personality disorders, I think, have those elements of deflection in the conversation because it's that whatever form to make you view admitting wrong as annihilation. So there, I think there's a lot of things that can contribute to making, I mean, even, I mean, even a, a standard person is going to react as admitting wrong as annihilation, but usually they just react to it as admitting wrong is, oh, that kind of wounds me, but I'm going to admit it. I'm going to own up to it because in the end, that's the truth, right? So anyway, that was what she was found to be, which is interesting. And so I guess histronic personality disorder, to my understanding on the psychologist testimony, is has an element of heavy narcissism in it. So, and it's, uh, it is, again, characterized by that externalization of, brain, of blame, which I find very fascinating. Um, so, there are people who tend to internalize blame, and that's, that means that they go inside themselves, and when they revisit a, a story or a scene or a fight, they're thinking about what they did that was wrong. And so they, they'll internalize and be like, this is my fault, I've got to, I'm the problem, I've got to figure out how to resolve this. And uh, externalizing blame is something that we can all do as an action, but if it's a uh, part of our normal behavior of, of interaction, then that is, that is a prop, that's problematic. So externalizing blame, it's always somebody else's fault and there's an inability to go inward and look at how, okay, this is my pro this is my part in this fight, and this is their part in this fight. Um, so when you externalize blame, you immediately, it is really the essence of deflection, immediately, this person's wrong. And from what I understood the psychologist say, saying with externalizing blame, there's also a tendency to split so if somebody, and I mean split as in splitting, as in viewing people as either all good or all bad, kind of idealizing them or demonizing them. And so splitting means somebody is initially completely idealized on a pedestal and then at a, in a moment of a fight or, a, or, or that person threatening your control, then, then that person becomes completely an object of hate and uh, a, per, a devaluing that kind of essence. They're demonized and devalued. And so that plays out in it. While a normal person can view someone as, okay, I can see their, I can see their flaws and I can see their strengths and I can see them all in this kind of nuanced portrait with mul you know, multi-dimensional being that I can love and get annoyed by. The, you know, um, so splitting and externalizing blame tends to have this sense of you are either you know, a, a excellent toy that's reflecting back to me what I wanna hear that, and that affirms me, that's love and idealization, or there's the hate, which is the you are completely evil for going against my view of the world and you are uh, no longer under my control and thus you are devalued, right? Um, and, so, and so the external blame plays into that by they're either, they're either giving you what you want or they're giving you what you don't want. And what's interesting too is there's just not an ability to see at the same time to like love somebody but also be kind of frustrated, or to be frustrated and thinking they're evil, but also able to see that, hey, this is caught, this is an emotional moment we're caught in. And so histri histrionic people too, I get, to my understanding, and borderline as well, they react to perceived slights. So this is similar to what I see in narcissists too, uh, this kind of reacting to something that you per they perceive as a, slight to them. Even sometimes if someone, you ask them a question when they're saying something they believe, they, they perceive that as this question is a threat to my authority or my control. And 
So all of this was very fascinating and I definitely recommend you go check out that clip because I'm really thinking about it and I think it's just really revealing because we, we for one it's revealing because we have um, assumptions about male-female dynamics and relationships and so we often just equate abuse as man perpetrator physical and woman victim and um, and weakened by it right whereas in this case we're not we're actually exposed to two ex important things one the reverse of this having a w w woman be the oppressive person that's victimizing a man and the fact that it's not just physical it is physical because she actually does hit him but it's uh, also emotional that really drives it and that's so insidious because emotional abuse is so corroding because emotional abuse makes you doubt yourself and your perspective and you outsource your own perspective to someone else and in a way that's like being drained by a vampire because you can't express what you think or feel that's just automatically deflected or and approached as wrong and so you just start to you start to just kind of lose a lot of your per, your personal self and sovereignty because you're always having to go along with this other person's point of view no matter how distorted it might look because you actually even doubt that you're your view of it being distorted you think well that's not true they must be right there because they're so certain or they're so confident or they're they are convincing in this way you know and so that kind of listening to those phone recordings and then listening to the trial now is a really important thing i think to do if you've been in these in a dynamic and like emotional abuse dynamics sometimes it's not just people who sometimes the people in it are just do acting out these behaviors unconsciously it's not necessarily a personality disorder but it's just useful to know the the language for all of this like knowing the language for externalizing blame knowing the language for deflection and knowing the language for uh this you know word salad all of those can kind of help you characterize when you're in these circular conversations and you're so infuriated and you're, you feel as though you're crazy because you think, I can't get through to this person no matter what. We, try, we are even recording the conversation so that maybe we can get some to an understanding and get to more clarity, but we just keep circling through the same, the same kind of crazy making talk. And so... It is so important to be aware of it because oftentimes when you're in this situation, you don't necessarily know what's wrong. You just have a sense of confusion because you think, I don't understand why explaining a very basic element of human decency isn't getting through to this person. And, or, or you think, I don't understand why, um, I'm trying my best to, to mitigate this problem, but it's like I can't quite see eye to eye and communicate and, and get that person to see what you know, my point of view or even respect it. Or, you know, there's uh, uh, any relationship that's healthy always has, re has the element of people wanting to understand each other, even if they don't. So there's always a level of wanting to understand and wanting to get past assumptions and fights, you know. And so I definitely think that it's very fascinating to watch this unfold and it will continue to unfold. And it's a, a further testament to how sometimes even though there's lies out there and, and that it seems like the evil person who has smeared someone is winning that the truth sometimes can be a long game process a slow burn process so stick with the truth and the truth will unfold and it will be such a light uh, amazing catharsis because for me it's really nice to see that finally 
Johnny Depp is be able to, you know, have a psychologist analyze Amber Heard, have all these people in his life affirm, hey, he he dealt with this and he has, you know, just to, uh, to, to attest to his temperament and his character and his integrity and to have it at not just the kind of knee-jerk idea, default idea that the woman who claims it believe all women, women, like that hashtag believe all women is very, is actually the harmful thing. We believe the truth, we believe things and we believe things in time. We don't just immediately pick a side and go with what we want to believe to support our current lens or confirmation bias about what abuse is and, and this kind of narrative that's constantly bad men, bad men, you know. This, so this is a huge victory as it unfolds and I hope that this encourages you to seek out those original recordings, their phone, conversations that are recorded, but they're also played during the trial. So definitely check all that out. It will be such a, a lot of revelations and a lot of affirmation if you've dealt with an emotional abuse situation. Whether It can also be something you dealt with at work because the communication is the same, that same kind of level of deflection. So hope this was helpful.